my name is Benjamin McIntosh. Today's date is February 27th, 2018, and I'm interviewing Dr. Mir Masum Ali at his home in Carmel as part of the Virginia B. Ball Center seminar, Muslims in Muncie. Dr. Ali, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you very much for organizing this. Our goal in this oral history project is to learn about your life and about your contributions toward building a community with fellow Muslims in Muncie, Indiana. I want to begin by asking for you to describe to us where and when you were born. I was born in a small town in Bangladesh, which, uh, which was at, my, during, at the time of my birth. Uh, it was a part of British India. It was in East Bengal. And it had a population, a very small population. And uh, interestingly, you couldn't go from the capital, Dhaka city, to my town uh, by road or by train. There was no train line, there was no road going there. The only way you could go is by river. And it would take, for like 120 miles, it would take two days to go there because the speed was only seven miles an hour. So it was kind of remote, but when I grew up there, I didn't realize it was that remote because I was only living there and we were very close to the sea. And uh, so it was a different uh, place now. It is not, uh, after 60, 70 years, it has completely changed. Now, I was born, uh, you can say that, in a kind of a middle-class family. My father was a lawyer there. He went to school when most of the people even didn't know what school was. It was in the very early 1900s, and uh, then he became a lawyer, and he was also a politician. Uh, my mother, in those days, Muslim women even wouldn't go to school, but my mother had uh, some education in school, and but didn't finish high school, but she was kind of a street smart. She knew everything that was happening around and over the world. And she was uh, a great advocate of education, especially for uh, female education. She sent my sisters to Dhaka. You can realize how difficult it was in those days to go to Dhaka for college and university education. And there was a lot of taboo in those days for uh, women to go to, you know, college and university. So. So it, it, it was, you know, my family's main goal was to, you know, provide higher education for their children. And they had eight children, four sons, four daughters. And I'm the fourth among the group and second among the sons. Now, uh, this, uh, the growing up was uh, very different than what it is now, I grew up in a predominantly Hindu family. Hindus had, you know, they were more oriented towards Western education. But in those days, the Muslims, especially those conservative Muslims, they would even ban Western education. So usually the Muslim students would go to religious schools and things like that. But there were Muslim people who made sure that people also go to regular schools, to Western schools. And uh, so my father, when he went, that was unknown. My school was built, I think, 1857, uh, during the uh, you know, Queen Victoria's Jubilee ce celebration. And uh, it was called Portugal Jubilee High English School. And uh, he, he went there. All my brothers and I went to the same school, and it's still it is there. And it's one of the best schools in the country, even though it is in, located in such a remote area. And uh, to tell a little bit about my uh, siblings, uh, I have three brothers who have all PhDs. I had my PhD, so they were very successful having all the four sons having PhD, that's, that was their dream. Uh, my sisters went 
through universities, etc. They had their masters, bachelors. My oldest one couldn't finish high school because she was married young. And now we have a big family with hundreds of nephews, nieces, grandchildren here and there, and they're all uh, very, very, uh, you know, successful in life. So uh, anything else that I can, I can uh, remember is when I grew up, uh, I, uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, Europeans and, you know, uh, nearby in another town who were there to preach Christianity. And uh, then there were Hindu culture. We, ours is really a mixture of everything. So we grew up, my father, he was a very religious man, but very secular. His outlook was completely very broad. And uh, he, uh, he wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't judge people by the religion or color or, and we still have that, uh, you know, values in us. And so do my children. And uh, he, we, in, in, in those days, while there was racial tension and this and not racial, uh, religious tension, uh, and, uh, and also British ruled us by divide and rule policy and their division was by religion. So there was, you know, very severe religious conflicts. And I remember a couple of things I would mention about my, you know, childhood. I remember very vividly the Second World War and uh, all the armed soldiers from America and uh, Britain, they were in my town, there was a warship and so on and so forth. So that memory, I still have that memory, you know, kind of fixed in my mind. The other thing was the 1947, uh, the big uh, riot in, in, in Bengal where hundreds of thousands of Muslims and Hindus were killed. And I remember how difficult time it was. There was, in one sense, people were very happy that they got their independence from the British, but then there was problem of this division. Now, my part, that Bengal, East Bengal, became East Pakistan. And Pakistan was divided into two parts, east and west, separated by 1,000 miles of Indian territory. And uh, the, really, there, is, there was no communication between these two groups. You know, they are kind of ethnically di different. Their languages are different. You know, uh, everything is really different, except that most of them, most of us were Muslims. So one of the things that I have learned is that culture is really more important than religion because religion really doesn't bind people. Otherwise, all the Muslim countries would have been one country, all the Christian countries would have been one country, and that's not. We are highly influenced by our own culture. So anything else that I might have forgotten, you might ask. So first of all, thank you for um, that wonderful answer. Um, I do want to go back, though, and talk a little, little bit about your parents. Can you tell me what their names were? Yes, my father's name was Mir Muazzam Ali. And um, your mother? Her name was Azifa Chaudhur Khatun. Azifa Khatun, but then Azifa Ali. Usually, our wives do not take their husband's names. That's the usual practice. Now we have changed, you know, uh, we take the last name. And you mentioned that your mother was very influential in your life, yes. and especially your sister's lives, uh, because she was such a strong proponent for um, education. women's education. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about your relationship with your mother? It was very good. He was one of the strictest persons I have learned in my whole life, I mean, seen in my whole life. She was, she was always there to see that we are studying. That was their goal. We couldn't mix with every kid, he would scrutinize really, screen out, said, you cannot be with that boy, you cannot be with that boy, because in th th those days were different. And uh, so he was, she was but, uh, very strict. Uh, I was kind of a naughty boy, you know, really, I was not like my other brothers and sisters. I did a lot of mischief in the house, but my father, mother was really very strict. But then 
she was very lovable. I still miss her. I mean, she was very lovable and uh, uh, she, uh, she, had told, she, she had foresight. I, I do not know if this is the appropriate place to tell, but I tell you something. We all of us, except two sisters who are in either US or Canada. So my mother used to tell, you know, when she's old, she was old and she said, why you kids are, you know, away from home? You have the highest education. You have already very good jobs back home. You don't need money. You don't need anything. Why you are so far away? It is never so good to be a second class citizen. That's what her fashion was. And he said, there would be a day. And we would tell, well, no, that's a very liberal country, very democratic and this and that. And my other, my other would say, well, there would be a day when you might worry about your kids. And uh, might be she was right at that time. You mentioned that growing up, there was a lot of religious diversity. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with your friends or neighbors that may have been Hindu? Did you participate with any practices with them? Or Well, everything in Hinduism I see, most of the things are very cultural, you know, it's like uh, uh, they even believe in God and everything, you know, it's different from ours. Uh, ours is more organized and things like that. But when we were kids, we really didn't look at each other as a Muslim or Christian or Hindu, nothing like that. Now, during our Eid, you know, the Hindu friends, they would come and eat our house, they would share our joys. During their pujas, which is their, you know, festivals, we'd join them, we'd celebrate with them. So we didn't feel anything, but to make it uh, clear, it was not always among the older people, you know. They might have had some problems because the religion was the issue which divided the country. But we never, I never felt when I grew up that he's Hindu or Muslim or Christian, I never. Speaking of divisions, you mentioned partition. And I'm curious to know how that may have impacted your family directly in any way. Uh, not my family as such, because we didn't have to move out. Our part of the, you know, area was part of Pakistan. So we didn't have to move, but it affected the Hindus who had to move to West Bengal. So we were not really directly, in, you know, affected, except that I lost most of my friends in high school who moved to India. And we were left with only a handful of you know, few Muslim students who were with us. So that was very sad. I still miss many of them. Can you tell me a little bit more about your experience in high school? Well, let me also tell you the high school, when I say high school, it's a little different from here. Uh, I didn't go, first of all, I didn't go uh, to kindergarten or first grade or second grade because there was no place to go except some religious schools where my parents didn't want us to go. So we were kind of, we'd have private tutors at home, taught us English and mathematics and few things. And then we were admitted to the third grade in that high school. That high school had from grade three to grade 10. And at the end of the 10th year, you take a final exam, which is the same exam given all over the country. You have to pass that to go to a two-year college. That's like your 11th and 12th grade now. Things have changed now. It's no longer like that. They have no 12 grades. And uh, then you go to the university. So there are, and when I took my high school exam, in my year, only 13 or 14 percent passed. The rest all flunked. It was so tough, so there was so tough. And there were not too many colleges. There was only one university. So there must be also a practical reason to fail so many, but now it is not. Now possibly 90% pass, 95% pass, something like that. What year did you go to university? 1953. And that was at University of Dhaka? University of Dhaka. 
And what was your first degree? My degree is in uh, statistics. We had two programs. One is called a pass, another is honors. Once you go into the honors program, it's a three-year program. And uh, pass is two years. And also I have to remind you that in our system, we used to have schools or classes for six days, Monday through Saturday, only one day holiday. And later on, I think it, you know, uh, it was Monday through half of Friday and then Saturday and Sunday, something like that. But I don't know currently what's happening, but it used to be six days. So uh, we really went, you know, for more, you know, days to classes. And also our classes would start early and end late. So I went, incidentally, I went into the honors program and uh, I finished my honors in statistics. That is what I really studied. And on, as, a subsidiary course, as subsidiary courses, I took mathematics and physics. And when you moved to Dhaka, what was that experience like coming from such a small, fairly remote town growing up? Well, I was a, a little bit different. I told you I was a very, I was uh, kind of mischievous. I was highly social. So it didn't take me too long uh, to, you know, get into the, you know, whole uh, act. But uh, I went to Dhaka many times, even though I lived there, I went there many times with my family, you know, for, you know, a lot of occasions. So I was familiar with that. The only thing was I went to Dhaka when I was in college. That was 1951. And I was a youngster. I was uh, hardly 14. Uh, these days, we don't even uh, want our kid, you know, grown up kid to go, you know, to another country or so. It was going to Dhaka was like going to another country. It was so difficult to go. And uh, so it, it's a good experience. So we, I lived in different you know, people came from different parts of the country. So, and we, we had to live in hostels. Uh, so it was, it, it, it's a different experience than uh, like in 11th or 12th grade, nobody here, you know, goes out of town or something like that. So it, it was uh, a lot of memories and a lot of experience, yes. And then after you graduated from the University of Dhaka, where did your life go from there? Okay, I graduated, I did my master's in 1957. Then uh, the chairman of my department told me to join uh, what was known as socio-economic board. They just started uh, to do some uh, kind of survey for that program. So I did that for a few months, then I joined the government of Pakistan and the Department of Agricultural Census to conduct agricultural census, uh, you know, throughout the country. To, uh, and uh, I was in Dhaka, I was posted in Dhaka. And in 19, I, I joined, I think, late 57 or 58. And in 1959, I, we had a party in our house and uh, we invited our neighbor who was, uh, his wife was the sister of my wife. So she, my wife had come to visit her sister. So since we invited the whole family, she came with her, with them. And I met her there on June 2nd. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. And we were married on June 29th of 20, 1959, only in 27 days. This was not, this was a different time. Parents, my, my, I, I called my mother. I talked to my father. They were mad at. <laughs> they would not want me to marry. He said, "I still remember my the uh, the line in English." She said, "Son, at your age, you see everything through colored glasses. That is not real life. Just stay there, stay put. You know, let's wait." Uh, but I was impatient. I didn't want to wait. So I called my, I went home and my mother was very upset. And she said, no, you can't. And this was like really for someone from Dhaka marrying someone in Indianapolis, you know, not knowing. 
So I uh, ultimately my mother gave in. She came to Dhaka and when she saw my wife, she said, well, I would rather I uh, want to see it done very soon and that's how we got married and we are married for now almost 59 years. And what is your wife's name? Her, we call her Lena, but her name is Firoza Chowdhury, but now she's Firoza Ali. And did, did it take her long to warm up to the idea of marriage or was she just as ready to go as you were? I think... <laughs> I think she might be more instrumental. She would not believe that, <laughs> but she would not admit. But yes, I mean, she was a teenager, you know. Uh, so, and you know, in those days, uh, she was 16. So in those days, 16 was like 25 now. They were more mature, you know, in their thoughts. And she, she had finished that college, you know, which is equivalent to your 12th grade here. So she, uh, so it was something, uh, uh, when I look back, I would not want my children to be like that, but uh, I did many things on impulse <laughs> in my life. But I didn't, luckily, I didn't regret, you know, my think I had good judgment. So at this time you were working for the government of Pakistan? Yes. Correct. And how long did you work for the government of Pakistan? Okay, then I uh, was transferred to Karachi, which was the capital at that time. And I my time frame might be mixed up, but I was there for uh, might be two years and then I was transferred to Lahore where the Agricultural Census Data Processing Center was located. So I worked there, might be for a year, year and a half, then I moved. I was transferred to Rawalpindi. At that time Islamabad was not built. So from Rawalpindi, I was transferred back to Karachi. And really, one of the uh, very senior officers in, uh, in that office, it's known as Public Service Commission, uh, which is different from here. They're the one who, you know, uh, appoints all the government employees and this and that, civil servants, foreign, serv you know, who, who are in foreign service and so on and so forth. So, I, there was one senior official who always kind of told me, why don't you go for your PhD? Why don't you go for your PhD? And he knew that my older brother had a PhD from Canada and he's a professor there. So, so he was telling me every day and every time he sees me, he says, did you apply? Did you do this? That? So that was something really triggered that thought in my mind and so I applied and my wife really kind of supported the idea. So that's how I came to Canada, to Toronto, on leave from the government, leave of absence. And uh, my, I left my family in Karachi just to see if after 10 years I'm ready to go back to school. So I went there in 1956. I finished my first, second master's in 1957. Uh, I lost a lot of weight because I had to study very, very hard. I forgot a lot of things. And then I took the, uh, you know, comprehensive for PhD. And I started in 1967 and I finished in 1969. And my wife joined me in 1967 with three daughters. And when we left, we had our son. So we had four children uh, by 1969. When you left? I uh, left for Muncie. And what influenced your decision to come to Muncie? Okay, that's possibly a very unique story in my life. I just never thought of coming to USA. I had no idea that I never studied there. I never had any friends in USA. I didn't have any relative in USA. So I was sitting in my, uh, you know, I was a kind of a graduate student who finished his PhD, uh, waiting for the final defense. And I was sitting talking to some other graduate students. All of a sudden there was a call. And uh, the person on the other side said, this is Dr. McKinney, I'm calling from Ball State University. I never heard in my whole life where Ball State or and I said, uh, what about? He said, well, we'd like to hire you as a 
uh, as an assistant professor in our department to teach statistics. I said, but I didn't apply. I, didn't, I don't know. Is it meant for my older brother who is a statistician? So he said, no, 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 it's for you. I don't know how he found my name through, might be some reference or something, because in those days it was very hard to bring people to Mansi. So the story is, I did not even pronounce it. He didn't say Mansi, he said Ball State. Then uh, he uh, sent me something, you know, and I used to pronounce it as Munsi, <laughs> not knowing that it is how to pronounce. And uh, I didn't want to come. I had no intention to be an academician because I was in the government for a long time and I was thinking of going back. But he was insisting and my older brother who was in Canada, he said, well, these guys are so serious. Don't just give a thought and might be you go and see. Uh, so I, I flew, they sent me, a, 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 frankly, another thing I would add. Nowadays, people just know that they're on, what is that called, H, H P visa or something, H, what is that called? Uh, H visa or, you know, like for visa. I did not yeah. know even the category of visa. They just said, go to the uh, uh, office, you know, uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, embassy or, you know, consular office in Toronto on University Avenue or someplace and pick up the visa. They will go with your passport, they will give you a stamp. That's how it was. So I, you know, when they called, I wouldn't come, I wouldn't come, but then they were calling, calling, calling. And then he said that even he talked about salary and this and that, nothing was. But my brother said, just go and see how it is. Without seeing, you don't say anything. So I was flying to Muncie. They had an airport in Muncie. They still have that, but there was flights from Chicago. I had no idea how big, how small town Muncie is. You didn't have GPS or anything in those days. You, I didn't know anything about this. I only figured out when I came to Chicago. When I came to Chicago, I flew from Toronto to Chicago. And then I said, well, I had to go downstairs. <laughs> and then I had to walk, to walk to a small plane. And I was the only person flying from Chicago to Muncie. It was a, might be a 10 seater, you know. I was worried to fly that <laughs> plane and it landed in a cornfield <laughs> in Muncie. One of the graduate students went there to pick me up and put me in the student center. I really literally had tears in my eyes. My wife called me and said, how do you do? I said, I'm coming back <laughs> as soon as possible. I don't know how people live here. There is nothing here. So that was my first impression. And uh, then, uh, uh, you know, my wife said, well, if you don't like, just come back. They said, but then I went to the department. There was no interview. It was whether I like it or not. It was just the other way. And I didn't have to give a talk or anything. They showed me here. They took me to the downtown because there was no mall or anything. Then they took me to, there was one Indian professor. I still remember they took me to his house. <clears throat> and when I saw him mowing the, <laughs> Long, I said, if that is the life, I'm not coming. <laughs> it would be very difficult for me. Uh, but then, to make it short, uh, they talked into it, and uh, my brother said, just, you know, they're offering you a salary, I think. Uh, you know, you should take it and see for a year. You have still leave of absence. So I came. I said, well, I'll stay here. So I came in 1969, and the rest is, as they say, history. I'm still, I'm still here in a sense. Now, uh, your wife was still in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, when you came first to Muncie? Or? The first day, first time, yes. And so how long was it before she joined you in Muncie? Oh, when I came, I mean, I, it was, I was, this happened in late July, and uh, then they have to go through all these formalities, and we came together. We actually, my older brother, you know, he drove from London, Ontario to Muncie. We arrived at about two o'clock in the morning, only to find there is, they had rented a house for me, only to find there is no electricity, no water. They had all, you know, disconnected. And it was a weekend. <laughs> so lucky for us, our neighbor, he brought a, you know, kind of a connection from his house water and electric, you know, some 
so that we could at least survive for a day or so. So that's how it was. But my wife came with me, yes. And so when you first came to Muncie, what was your, um, what were other impressions you had of it? I mean, there was no road from Muncie to Indianapolis at the time. Well, there was, but I did not know. I, I could not drive a car because I couldn't get a license. It, uh, you had to wait six months before you can get a driver's license. That was the rule those days. So how did you get around in those early days? I hardly <laughs> went around. I just went to the department. Uh, some of my colleagues would give me rides. Uh, and there was a taxi even in those days. So I would take that. That's how. Did you, have any, did you have any interaction with other Muslims in the community? Had you met any other Muslims? Uh, no, uh, there was uh, not that I knew of. I, there was one family. Uh, he was uh, he was from Pakistan. His wife was from the United States. She was also a faculty at Ball State, but I did not know at that time, you know, uh, who he was. Not in the first year or so, because I did, you know, I mean, Muslim was not in my mind at the time. I came as a Pakistani, you know. That's what my you know, I was thinking, and uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't even expect any Muslim to be there, looking at the city. You know, at that time. Were you nervous about identifying as a Muslim when you first came to Canada? No, the no, no, not at all. I mean, uh, I, as I said, you know, I, I didn't think about Muslim or Islam or anything because I have lived. I also lived in the in in while I was with the government of Pakistan. I was in Italy, in Rome. I was in. London, uh, England, I lived in Karachi, etc., you know, all different places, not in... So I was used to living among people of other, you know, nationality, race, color, so it, it didn't bother me. Can you, uh, or were there any cultural differences that were particularly difficult for you when you arrived in the West? So not the really. I, I grew up in a very different, you know, it, it may not be the same for others, but uh, I grew up in a very different uh, atmosphere, you know. So it was, nothing was really uh, kind of strange for me or difficult for me. And I was aware of the, you know, uh, differences, but uh, I, I never really felt anything like that. I, uh, I mean, I lived in a neighborhood, you know, everybody white. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, d I didn't look at them as white or anything because I don't see my color. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you understand what I mean. So it is not the color, religion, these were not in my mind. I was, I would mostly identify myself as a faculty at Ball State. That was my identity. How did your practice of Islam change from when you were living in uh, Dhaka or your hometown mm -hmm. versus when you came to both Canada and the United States? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, when I lived in Dhaka, actually in 1947, my country was, uh, India was partitioned. I lived in Muslim majority, you know, 95%, 96% Muslims. So religion was never in our mind because we were all Muslims. I don't think uh, anyone here in America, you know, he always thinks about himself as a Christian. I don't know. I mean, it's not always in his mind that, you know, I'm going there, you know, is there a Christian? I don't know. I never had that feeling. So really, uh, it, you know, when I grew up or when I came to the West, that was not uh, in my mind. I never identified. But practicing Islam, uh, well, when you're young, I mean, I... I was born Muslim, I am still a Muslim, but you know, you don't do a lot of things, like even Christians don't all go to church, but they're Christians, you, you understand. So when you are young, you don't do many things, but when you grow older, then you get into religion, if you believe in religion. And uh, uh, it was a sense of, in Canada, I had no time to think about religion. You know, I finished my master's in one year, PhD in two years. So it's just work, 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 you know. But uh, when I came here, uh, then I thought my initial goal was to make my children, who were really very small at the time, uh, to make them familiar with the Islam, 
is with the religion, uh, their father, their parents, their grandparents, you know, practice so that they know where we come from. So that was the reason why I thought that if we have a place, they will know more about the religion. And of course, there will be a place for us to, you know, pray or perform uh, fasting or, you know, celebrate it, things like that. So, so that was my really reason at that time, not to build a community, but it was formed gradually. If possibly I would not have established at that time, somebody would have done it later. But uh, this was, and there was, they have really, so far as my children are concerned, they hardly know anything about my culture, except when we went home for a couple of, you know, for a month or so, but not too often we went. And uh, now the children have a different feeling because they are growing among Muslims, you know. So it, my children grew up very differently from those who are growing, now, growing up now in Carmel or in Fishers, you know. They see a lot of Muslims, a lot of Muslims. There was nothing at that time. Can you describe for me the first few people that you reached out to to start building this this community of Muslims in Munsee? Really, it was the international students. It was the international students who heard that I was, a, you know, Muslim faculty, and I was thinking of finding a place for praying and etc. So they came to me, and they asked if we should build something, you know, we should have something. So I, we thought about it and that's when we talked to the university and uh, the university allowed us to pray in the student center. That's how it started really. It was really the students. Now, what nationalities were those first initial students that came, the international students that came to Ball State? Well, my memory is kind of vague, but I think uh, some of them went, were from Libya. At that time, Libya was a great friend of the United States, so there are a lot of Libyan students. And uh, there were uh, Iranian students. Uh, there were Saudi students, not as many as we have now. Uh, I think basically this is what I recall. Not very, too many. And were there just a handful of, of students? Uh, or are we looking at five or 10? How many do you think? Yeah, it might be between five and 10. And you mentioned that you met in the student center initially, uh, in room 311? Yes. And um, how did you go about getting that room? Uh, we had to kind of uh, contact the university and uh, tell I think uh, I think it doesn't exist today. We used to have an office of religious programs, and Dr. George Jones, he was the director of that. And uh, there was also a dean of students, which doesn't exist anymore on campus. So they they were the one uh, dean of students should look after these student things, and uh, there were a lot of religious groups on campus. And so we found out how to go about it, and there are some forms we had to, but to get the room, we didn't have to do anything. We just went to the Office of Religious Programs and they somewhere, I don't, you know, I was too young and not, I didn't know too many things at that time. So they really arranged it for us and said, well, you go to room, your small group, room 311 is all right. That's how we, and uh, uh, one or two local, uh, you know, community members would come at that time. Uh, they're, they're all African Americans. And then you moved after the students are to the space? Uh, because we grew bigger, so they moved us to the basement of the old international house. That was, I think, on College Avenue. And that was in 1974? Around that time. And at that time, what was the makeup of the, the people in the in in the group? It didn't really have a name yet, did it? Pardon? No, it no, well, just as before? Muslim students, or is, you know. Uh, I think there are a few Bangladeshis because after I joined, uh, 
because of my presence on campus uh, and statistics, uh, number of statistics, Bangladesh students from statistics started coming to Ball State. So there are some of them. Uh, there were uh, this Arab group. They were predominantly the main Middle Eastern students. They were the predominant group. And in the early days, there were a lot of Iranians. But as you know, they belong to a different sect. Uh, many of them would choose not to come. They, some of them would come and many of them really didn't, you know, really go to any mosque or anything. And uh, some of the, among the uh, African-Americans, uh, they used to belong, uh, those who came to Sunni Islam, they were part of the, what is it called, Nation of Islam, Farrakhan's, you know. And I believe it was in 1966 or 67, they, they all went, a lot of African Americans went to Chicago and changed their affiliation from Nation of Islam to real, you know, Sunni Islam. And uh, Amir Shabazz, his name was different when I first came, you know, I mean, I forgot, but he was one of them and uh, the other one was Rashid, uh, I don't remember, is he, is he also Shabazz, Rashid Shabazz? Uh, these are the two who regularly came to the mosque. Uh, and uh, so this was a small group. Now I'd like to mention something. I have the files, I have the papers, I can, if you want, I can uh, uh, give you for record. I could remember only about 12 or 13, you know, Muslim students, but from the university, they used to, in those days, print out a list of students who belong to different faiths. So among the, those who indicated Islam as their faith, there was a list of 57 names. It has 57 names. I now found out just a couple of days ago in my files. But I possibly, they didn't possibly come to mosque or they didn't care, you know, young people. So I did not really know that. Uh, mostly uh, like 12 or 13, 14 people, there's. And Amir Shabazz and Rashid uh, Shabazz, they both joined this organization, the community, uh, when you were still in the International House, correct? The, yes, they were to come to prayer. And then in 1975, uh, you decided to make this an actual organization, correct? Yeah. Uh, no, the, first we started. Uh, uh, as Ball State University Islamic Association, not knowing anything, I was new here, you know, and I just said, well, what should I call? So we called it Ball State University Islamic Association, and that's how it is. It was listed officially somewhere. But then uh, some of the students, I was really naive about these things. I did not know much because I didn't live here before. I didn't go to school here before, so I had no idea about the U.S. at that time. So. Some students approached me and said, how about becoming a part of MSA? And I said, what is MSA? He said, Muslim Student Association. And it's a national organization. And I said, what do we benefit from that? He said, well, we'll be in touch with other organizations in the country. And uh, we get their free newsletters. And uh, uh, maybe we'll be able to bring in speakers through them, things like that. So that's how uh, we decided, uh, I think somewhere it says 77, but uh, but might be in, uh, we, we changed it in 77, but the constitution was written in 78. Uh, that's what I found in my papers. And were Amir and Rashid large players in, ch in, in changing no, the name? No, or? no, no. They were not students because these are all student things. They had nothing to do with this. They would just come, pray, and go. And they encouraged a lot of other African Americans to be part of this group. And so they used, there used to be a few others in those days. It sounds like Rashid and Amir were very well connected in the community. 
were they charismatic uh, leaders in that regard? Uh, in the beginning, I didn't think that way. They were kind of rocked, you know, they would come pray and, uh, and they were young at that time. You have seen a different, you know, Rashid, gray hair and all this, but he, at that time he was very young. He was a basketball player, he came here, you know, and all this, so he was young. But at that time also they were new in the religion. So it was a little different. Uh, I didn't see them that involved. I think their goal or mission could have been to bring in the African-American Muslims into this fold and to encourage them to come and pray. So th th that's what their role was in that sense from the community point of view. Did their involvement grow over time? Yes. And I'll come to that if you go a little farther for when we move uh, from, uh, well, we moved to Calvert Street. Uh, that was uh, 1977, 78 in that uh, time frame. And that's when uh, uh, he would spend a little time in the, you know, center there in that apart. It's really a floor, one room thing in the second, on the first floor. So he would spend a little time there. And I think he was getting more knowledgeable about the religion. This is my personal feeling, not what he told me. I could see his change uh, from jeans to this, uh, you know, Islamic garb. So he would spend more and more. And he was to me like a young kid at that, because I was a professor, he was an undergraduate student. And he, he would call me always, hey, Dr. Ali. and he never called me Mir or anything. That's how he would call, hey, Barami, this and that. But when I'm concerned, he would always, because he remembers the initial contact and he would always show that regard as a professor. Uh, so his change was, I would say, gradual, not an overnight change. Uh, when we moved to Calvert, he was not, he was involved, but not in the operation and anything like that. It was still a student organization. And I do not know if he ceased to be a student at that time. You understand? Uh, we don't know. But uh, when we moved to the Ball Avenue Mosque, that's when he started, because now it is an independent building. It used to be a church. We bought that, converted them, it into a mosque. And he started spending more and more time there. He would read more and more. And he became so knowledgeable in Islam that he started giving khutbah or the sermons during Friday prayers. So there is a, that's when I would say he had his transformation. So just to recap, <clears throat> the organization began in the student center and then transitioned to the international house and then transitioned to 506 Calvert Street, mm -hmm. and then to 1717 Ball Avenue, and then of course later to the Calvert, uh, the, uh, right, but Hessler. Right. Um, throughout these changes over, over the decades, um, was it difficult to keep the community together, or was the community very supportive of these changes to larger mm -hmm. locations? What do you mean by community? Are you talking about students or the local Mansi community? Both. Uh, students had no problem, but Mansi community was never involved in this. It is the student group. We, uh, the constitution dictated electing students in different positions and the faculty advisor. So it was always the student group who would control the regular activities, you know. Uh, they would only come almost like a guest, you know, and pray. So. To answer your question further, if you know how he got involved, how this change took place, uh, when I was uh, I was uh, the faculty advisor for a number of years. Then I think in the in 1981 or 82, I decided not to be a faculty advisor anymore because I was busy with my research, teaching, and this and that, and there were quite a number of other Muslim faculty by now on campus. And even the constitution doesn't dictate that a faculty advisor has to be a Muslim. It could be any, anyone. 
So I said that it's time for somebody else. And so there was, there were different people who served as faculty advisors. Then I became a faculty advisor again um, around 80, 1987. And uh, I figured out at that time, we became quite big at that time, the local non-bullshit group and also in the surrounding area. And this was at the Ball Avenue? Avenue. And I felt there was some conflict between the students and the local group in the administration of the mosque, not with prayers or anything. And so I thought and thought what how, kind of what we could do, what kind of solution we can find. Then I decided, I felt that the mosque is a community thing. And MSA is a ball state thing. Let us not mix it together. And now there is a lot of people in the community. The mosque has to be taken care of by the local people. Students come for a year, two, three, then they leave. So we have to make the decision as a community. So I made a suggestion that we have now two groups, one student group, the other one is the Islamic Center group. You know, we call it, we gave a new name, Mansi Islamic Center, where the community would be part of the members, part of the responsibility would go to the community and there will be also student representation on that since they come to this mosque. That's when, and we decided that the student MSA would do their usual activities, you know, what they used to do, except the mosque in the sense uh, that most of the things like if, you know, paying the bills, these, that, the, you know, the, this group should take. Another thing was I felt we, we were responsible as, uh, uh, you know, this MSA was responsible for everything to Ball State. We had to make sure we have filled the, you know, tax forms, these, that, electric bill, anything, you know. So it's a hassle. Now, if this hassle goes to the local group, then students don't have to worry about all this. So that's when I think we decided to become two groups. And that's when, to answer your earlier question, uh, Amir got very involved when it became a, you know, Islamic center, then it doesn't have a student level. And he became very, very involved with the mosque and he would spend time there. And that's where I first saw him in the you know, kind of Arab or Muslim garb and things like that. As a matter of fact, I went for Hajj and he said, when you go there, Dr. Ali, from Makkar, Medina, you buy one of those dresses for me and especially black, not white. <laughs> so I had brought, bought and brought for him. That's when I think he transformed and I think he became very, very knowledgeable in Islam. He really spent lots and lots of time uh, studying and he could speak freely. He could give the sermons very freely. And uh, if I may add, he, did, he didn't have any fear to open his mouth. We would sometimes control things, uh, you know, because he was a community leader, he was an activist, you know, so he, he could say anything. Uh, so he was very forceful and really he was a very, strong spokesperson for the Islamic group on, in Mansi community. He has a lot of contribution. If you talk about building the community, uh, he, he, uh, he had some, you know, I mean, uh, he comes from a different background. Uh, initially, he didn't realize that. He would think that all, you know, the students who are coming here possibly come from the same background or anything. So he had a little, but then he realized, he understood, and uh, he mended things, and uh, uh, he, he, he was loved by every, everyone. And 
I will finish this about him with a couple of remarks, how he became president of MSA, um, uh, of the Islamic Center. So we were having an election. Everybody was, you know, uh, well, because Amir was also very vocal, very opinionated. So there was a group who really love him. There was a group who would not. And that's always the case. So there was election. Usually we had election. No election. It is by acclamation. You know, nobody wants to be, you know, take this kind of responsibility. So usually we have a person and everybody says, I, I, it's done. But then one faculty who was from Bangladesh, he was nominated for that. And before we could say I, some other person just, I think he told me later jokingly, he said from, he was in the other room. He just walked in and he said, I nominated Amir. And then we had to vote <laughs> because it is no longer acclamation whether he was serious or not. So we voted and he won with, you know, I mean, uh, majority of the votes overwhelmingly. So that's how he started his role as, a, as an advisor and that gave him the impetus to work hard. And do you remember what year that was? Pardon? Do you know what year that was that he became president? Okay, we had, okay. when did we move to 78? Uh, in the 80s, some were uh, 80, uh, when we moved to uh, Hessler, uh, seven, uh, 2007. So it, it could be 2000, 1999, around that time. I cannot really, I have to check. And you mentioned that he, was very opinionated and some people liked him and some people didn't. At that time, when he was young. What were those issues that really divided people um, that he felt passionate about? Well, uh, again, these are from my recollection, my impression. This, you know, impressions are not facts. Uh, well, because, you know, we are all subject to our, you know, our opinions are based on what we have experienced before. So he would, look at things, even what his students did, from his perspective. Uh, you understand? And uh, uh, he was very concerned, very aware of his roots, of his, if I may use the term, blackness. And uh, he, once I still clearly remember, he stood, he was giving sermons. He said, you people are so, I should, I do not know if I should say this, It uh, you know, but he told that uh, your children, they would marry whites, but not blacks. So that is an opinion, you know, and that would divide, you know. But then he realized, then he realized that it was not right to, because, so, because he told this, I understood from where he comes, but some other people listening might not have understood that. But he was always, always, he respected me, he liked me. And I saw him almost the day before his death. I, I was there at his bedside and he held my hand uh, and he was playing a tape of the Quran. And uh, he said, Dr. Ali, your son came, he was a doctor at that time at Ball Hospital. He said he came to me and he spent a lot of time with me. I'm so happy because he saw him growing up. From, and so he, he had a lot of respect for me. That's why I, did, I hesitated to make these comments. But this is something, I mean, you should know for historical reason, you know. But he, he was always a very nice person. I liked him. And uh, uh, he, uh, our friendship, you know, lasted for the rest of his life. He visited our house uh, during Eid and all these places. We'd always have him at our house. We'd have Rashid at our house. 
And were other members like Rashid also concerned about ra the racial tensions within the mosque? He was a low person. He would not, he never gave a but he would give the adhan, which is the call of prayer. But uh, he would be just a nice person. You know, he didn't take the leadership role in the- Rashid, you mean? Rashid. Um, did, these, did these tensions cause any divide within the community? No. No, no, no. They, they, said, they knew, they would say, oh, that is Amir, like that, you know. And around this time, what was the, if you could guess, what was the racial percentages, I suppose? Were there more um, African Americans versus uh, other international? No, the, the, the African Americans were always left, fewer in number. There are not too many who would come, you know. And were there more were there more local community members versus students, or was it more fifty fifty? I think uh, at that time it would. There is always, I think, more students than still. There are not too many, you know, uh, Muslim uh, faculty or doctors there. You know. So when the community was trying to purchase the house at seventeen seventeen Ball Avenue. Was it primarily students who so, footed the bill? Or? I have to answer this question this way, both this purchase and the other purchase. As you see, I have never taken any role as a president. I never wanted to be a president of anything. I was a faculty advisor. I always wanted to work in the back rather than in the, because uh, I know my strength, I know my weakness. I wouldn't be able to handle if there is a dispute or something. I can't, uh, you know, my nature would not allow me. So I never wanted to be that. So when this uh, property at 1717 was bought, I even didn't know. So, so I just found out later that a property was bought because it was a di different group at that time. Who purchased it? How did you find Whoever it? Whoever purchased I do not want to name. I mean, the group purchased, but there were different people at that time, you know. So I had, I had no idea how this property was purchased, who purchased. Uh, the only thing I heard was, you know, local. We always contributed a little money for mosque. And, uh, they raised funds outside or from outside, you know, that's all. But I have not seen the papers or anything, nothing. I, I just go there to pray. But I was kind of upset, obviously. But uh, that's the story behind, you know, that purchase. I don't know. You say you were upset. Were you upset that no one told you beforehand? Or yes. You... Okay. Yes, but... That's, that's, that was not right. So there was, you know, no matter how you go, when people, there are more people, there'll be more thinking, more, uh, you know, some would like, some would not like, you know, it goes on. So I, I let it go, I didn't, you know, the important thing was that it goes, you know. And then when the decision was made to purchase the new location on Hessler, mm -hmm. were you involved in that decision-making process? No. Were funds raised in a similar fashion? Yes, uh, I knew because I contributed. We I contributed quite a bit to that, but I was not involved. I only was involved at the end when they looked at. It. They I heard that there is a mosque committee. I think they put my wife there because she was a representative of the women's group there, but I. Uh, they would sometimes, you know, raise some funds in somebody's house, you know. So there is some, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> how do I put it? Not everything goes smoothly, you know. Uh, but my goal was to see that it keeps on going, you know. So I personally, I have no idea, I have not seen any document or anything where this money was from, I know I, I paid as a professor quite a bit of money. There were 
few doctors who paid a lot of money, but that would not buy one million dollars. So they had to raise. I know uh, at Al Huda they used to come because they told me that oh they used to come here to raise funds, and so might be that's how they did. And was the decision made based on an increase in participation at the mosque? Yeah. And the ball avenue was just too small. Yes, too small. Yeah. Now you mentioned. Uh, your wife was involved in the women's group at the mosque. Yeah. Um, how, would, did that have a strong impact on the community at large? Were there, were there a lot of women involved in that? No, just uh, there, this is for the women's welfare, you know, to call such and such, you know, which Bibi Bharam used to do, you know, bring a good dish, nice dish for everybody, things like that, you know, uh, mostly to look after the women's uh, activities. It, it was not that. Uh, organized in those days as it is now. You mentioned the Barami just now. I wanted to ask you um, about her election uh, as president mm -hmm. of the Islamic Senate. Now she is fairly unique in that regard. There's not a lot of um, female presidents around the country uh, of Islamic centers. Um, do you know what the, rea what the reaction was uh, in the community? No, I was not there at that time, but uh, first of all, to answer your question, the constitution, I had actually written the constitution of the mosque initially, and then it might be, you know, there were new versions. But the constitution doesn't say anywhere that a woman would not be allowed to be a president, that this is only for male, it is not. So uh, there was no problem. There was no problem in her election. I do not know, there might be some, you know, many times, People have something in their mind, but they don't express. I didn't see any any problem. I think she is doing fine, you know. Uh, so, and women historically, if you look, uh, they were in big positions from the past. When even in this, in the West, there was like even in my country, Bangladesh, we had two, you know, prime ministers were women. Currently, you know, the prime minister is a woman. Uh, if you Look at uh, in the, uh, Pakistan. There was prime minister women. If you look at Indonesia uh, and places like that, uh, so uh, the women are there. You know, we still have to find women in that you know position here. But we have no problem. I, there would be always some people with that kind of feeling that we shouldn't be, uh, because I'm. I feel the, this. Uh, Came, comes from the fact that, uh, like in Christianity, you know, in some form of Christianity, a woman would not be able to be, what do you call, it, pope or, I mean, in Catholic or priest, something like that. In the same way, a woman cannot lead a prayer, the men. So, so from that point of view, some people feel that, you know, men should be the leader, you know. But that's my very few, and with more education, you know, people mind this change. I don't think she, she got any opposition. I, I never heard. So I want to ask you about the practices in the mosque and the decisions behind a few of them. For instance, how did the early community decide when to um, observe Ramadan? Okay. I think when it was very early, in the, you know, uh, in this establishment of the Islamic community. I don't think we had problem. Fewer the people, less is the problem. So I, we just would get news from a student or somewhere that that's the day it is going to be celebrated because our religious things are all based on lunar calendars. And especially for uh, the Eid after Ramadan, you have to see someone has to see the actual moon and have to vouch that he has seen, he has witnessed this. So some feel that, well, we live in a modern time. We can actually tell that the moon is up now. We don't have to go in the, you know, snow or something, you know, and watch. So there is always difference in opinions. Uh, I did not face it in the early years, I never. But as more people started coming with different views, uh, then uh, some would 
majority would, you know, say, perform Eid on a certain day, but there would be always some who might perform it the next day or day before, depending on the, you know, uh, month. So, but it never caused any problem or anything. I mean, they would do it very quietly. They would not like to upset, but their belief in those things are so strong that we cannot talk them into changing. You know, I didn't think it was proper to do that. That's as we feel some way, somebody else, you know. But I personally did worry too much about all those things. Were there other practices that were contentious in the early days or in the later period? No, well, mainly just we went for uh, these prayers, you know, uh, 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 Juma prayers, and there was nothing much. And in the, especially, especially in the early days when we didn't have mosque or anything, uh, students had classes, so it would be a short sermon and then we are off to classes. So really there was no problems, no difficulties. But later, there is nothing in practices, but with the, especially the Ramadan. I'm sure you are aware of it. That's why you were asking me the question. Uh, yes, there is always a difference. Even in our countries, there is one group, they would go by Saudi Arabia, another group who would go by I, you know, their own thinking that, well, it says, you know, it should be today and they would do it today, things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a comment, nothing new to this group. I know that a lot of mosques around the United States go off of the Islamic Society of North America's call, uh, so to speak, on that. Um, did, did that organization have any impact on the Islamic Center in Muncie? Uh, which organization? I couldn't. Um, ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. No, well, there is no tie. Even now, I think with ISNA, we, we never had any. Uh, you know, we we are not a national thing. It's just a local, and we didn't have any tie or anything. The goal initially, as I said, was uh, to have something where our children can learn the Quran and education. But then we didn't have anyone to offer that service in the, uh, you know beginning because the students were busy with their own studies and everything so even now I think now they're holding Quran classes and things like that so it evolved into that if there was nothing to begin with it would not have, it would have taken more time to do that so um, speaking of other organizations mm -hmm. did the Islamic Center of Muncie ever have any interaction with the uh, Muslim Alliance of Indiana uh, they're a political advocacy group? No, not that I know of. Okay. And then um, back to practices. You mentioned earlier in the interview that you had gone on Hajj. Could you tell me a little bit more about that experience for you? Okay, well, I before I went to Hajj, I went to what we call Umrah. I was a visiting professor at uh, University of uh, King, King South University just for a short time. So I went to Mecca for Umrah and there was a student who was here, he was kind of a student leader. He was at that time in Mecca and he showed us all the important places and this and that. So I, every Muslim wants to visit, you know, perform Hajj and that is actually mandatory for us, one of the five pillars. So we decided to go before it was too long. And I was at that time kind of sick, very ill, I had a lot of health problems, but uh, it was, I think in 19, 2006, I believe we went for Hajj. Uh, it is, it was, it's, it was very difficult to perform with so many people you know, squeezed in such a small place. Everything is tight, really. Uh, I had, I had to go from Medina to Mecca by bus. It is only 250 miles. It took us 18 hours. And then the bathroom broke in the bus. So you can imagine there were 
women, men, children. So uh, it is very, very difficult. Now, if you're young, it, it's not so demanding. And that's why I think people are encouraged to go when they're young. But we go, try to go before we die. We think, you know, we do it as our last right. Uh, it is spiritually uplifting when you visit the first mosque of Muhammad, you know, Prophet Muhammad, we always say, peace be upon him, after we pronounce their, you know, their name. I saw where his grave is in the great mosque. Uh, so these are something like when I'm here, it doesn't resonate, you know, it's always something, you know, some up there, but you, when I went there, I touched the grave, then I really know that this person, you know, existed. I can, uh, you know, he built, he prayed in that there is a small mosque uh, that he had built. So there is the cave where he meditated, where he was revealed this Quran, according. So when you see these things, it, it has a tremendous impact on you. Just like, you know, when uh, Jews go to, you know, Israel and touch the wall, or it is something for them. It is the same way every time. As a matter of fact, that whole area, you go there, it, it, it really brings in something, you know, spiritually. So it was physically very difficult, but we had some young Bangladeshi people with us who went for Hajj. Uh, who took care of me. He would not, I didn't have to stay in the line to get the food, especially in uh, Mina, where you stay in, a, in tents. These are not like that. It's a very good tents, you know. They're permanent tents, you know. And so they helped me a lot. There is a place where you have to throw stone. That is stoning the devil. And I did not go the first day. My wife said, don't go. Uh, and my, my wife was separated from, females are separate from males. So thanks God we had the cell phone so we could talk. Uh, and uh, so there were personal discomfort, except when I was in a hotel, five-star hotel in Medina or in Maka, that's different. But that performing that, we had to reach somewhere uh, by such and such time and uh, lie on the ground, you know, sleep there. Uh, so. These are some difficult tasks, but it is really very uplifting. Uh, and especially uh, the going around the Kaaba. I mean, Kaaba is just an ordinary, you know, like a, like a block in a square. And, uh, but when you go there, it's, the feeling is, it's impossible to, you know, describe. So it is very uplifting and uh, uh, it would stay with her. My wife wants to go again because she thinks it was not enough. Uh, uh, so it is, and you meet the, to me, I do not, I'm not a big religious scholar, but if there is any reason why this was made kind of, you know, mandatory for able Muslims is because of this diversity that you see there. You see people from all over the world, different languages, different dresses, different all kinds of things they are gathering there. People would go, they would go through many hardships. People would walk thousands of miles. People would take the boat and, you know, ship. And it, it was very difficult. Now it is very easy. You go there, if you have money, you are in luxury, you know, so I don't know. The effect is the same, but it still is very, very uh, rewarding experience. I would like to go there one more time at least before I die, if health permits. How would you characterize your personal practice of Islam today? Uh, it's a very personal question. <laughs> uh, I do as much as I can so far as the practicing like, you know, you have seen the praying. I cannot pray the way 
everybody prays. I pray in a chair because I cannot bend, I cannot, you know, have problems. I have uh, what you call a vertigo. So I, I'm always on a, in a chair for many years. To me, I have taught my children beyond religion, the first thing is that they have to be good people. They have to help others. They have to be kind. They have to be loving. This is my religion. That's what I feel. Not do any backbiting, not be jealous, which we all are, we get from time to time, you know. If, you know uh, so th these are the things I really believe to help people. If uh, I give you an example, how I feel. Uh, once I was in Mansi and I went to a graduate student's house. He invited me for dinner and there was a girl there. And she said, I asked her, what do you, she said, well, I'm in uh, physics department. I'm a graduate student. I said, do you have assistantship? She said, no. I said, then that's a lot of money out of state. Who is paying? She said, I have a brother in uh, San Francisco. He is supporting me. I said, that's a lot of money to support, you know, and uh, that is a lot of money before taxes, you know. So I said, did you study uh, uh, any mathematics? He said, yes, I studied calculus in ca university in my BS. So I called our chairman from that house and I said, Don, I have a student here she doesn't have any, and I think we have an assistantship unfilled because some students couldn't come. Do you think we can use her? She said, just send to me. I think we have no problem. We'll be able to. That's how she didn't even ask. I just felt, I said, I mean, if I were her, what would be my position, you know, to have so much help from somebody else? So I just uh, couldn't stop there. And this is what sometimes some of my friends, and then sometimes you have difficulties doing this. So sometimes my friends would tell, you p try to help people, you know, when they don't even ask for help. And that's why sometimes you are upset, <laughs> you know. So uh, those are the things I think. And of course you do your religious thing. That's your personal thing. Uh, I, my belief in religion is, as I would tell, religion is a way of life. It, whether it is Hinduism, Muslim, Islam, Christianity, atheism, whatever it is, uh, it doesn't matter. Each of us is responsible for our destiny. Either we believe in a destiny or not. So uh, this is something for me to reconcile with my God. And uh, I think to me, if I have lived a life where I didn't do any major scenes or uh, things. I hurt people, you know. Uh, I think I feel there would be a place for me in God's house, you know. That's my faith. And I try to follow Islamic things as much as possible. I'm honest. I possibly don't, you know, do everything that is, you know, uh, that should be, you know, that's supposed to be done by every Muslim. And I'm sure if I ask many Muslims, they would be with me. It's, it's difficult, but we try. Aside from clearly being a part of the uh, Islamic Center of Muncie, um, were you involved in any other organizations when you were living in Muncie? I mean, uh, outside the campus? Sure. No, I was, uh, 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 I think the one I remember uh, that was with Rotary, you know. I was part of the Rotary Club uh, in the beginning. No, uh, I didn't do any, but I did a lot of uh, work for the foreign students. Uh, every time a student came from so Bangladesh or, you know, uh, that might be Korea or that. I would come to uh, 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 Indianapolis airport, might be at two o'clock in the morning, doesn't matter. I'll get them from the airport. They will stay with me for 
three days, four days, until they find a place either in Scheidler or in Anthony, you know. Uh, so uh, we did this for a long time. And they would, uh, then my wife would take them for, you know, grocery and all these things. So uh, that we provided and, uh, you know, irrespective of where they're from, we try to do, but mostly Bangladeshi students, they would know me and they would, you know, uh, write to me. But uh, while well, in the university, uh, you know, my wife was involved, but I was not uh, except professionally, you know, organizing conferences, this, that, but. Did you think, did you feel that the broader Munsee community was supportive of the Islamic Center throughout its history? Yes, I, I, you know, I mean, if somebody had something in their mind, you know, that they didn't express, but in general, I think uh, it, they were supportive. Were there any hostilities from in I, I, individuals or? I, I didn't, I never heard a single, you know, word like that of hostility. So in 2003, um, there was a National Day of Prayer at the Unitarian Universalist Church, and they hosted a series of study circles to discuss things like cultural differences and race. Um, and a few years later, um, Amir Shabazz, he essentially credited a lot of university-educated Muslims in Muncie um, with fostering debates like that and discussions like that to help um, make Muncie um, more receptive and more accommodating to um, Islam and to the Muslims in the community. Um, um, were you aware of, of his sentiment um, towards people at the university um, and things like that? Okay, uh, let me go back to uh, a, a question you asked me about my involvement in. I uh, remember when I first went to Muncie, I used to be frequently asked by churches to go and give talks, to talk about Islam. So I did that in the early years when there was not much on TV or in print, you know, they would like to hear from a real guy who is Muslim. So I gave, I used to give a lot of talks and uh, it was always very nice. And another thing that I might mention, when we were in the early stages, I talked about the Office of Religious Programs. There were many student uh, religious groups and we used to have meetings, monthly meetings. And I don't know if th that group still exists, you know, that religious groups, you know, we used to meet uh, the bank, uh, what is that, Church of Assisi, you know, what is that, you know, no, is that? Was it the one right on the corner of campus? Uh, that's on uh, Riverside. Yeah. 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 So we used to go there and we, you know, and uh, there was one uh, Jewish guy, his name was uh, Freund, last name. He was a lawyer. I was a very good friend of mine. He was, he, he, would, he liked to play bridge and I'm also a bridge player. Uh, we were friends for a long time. He was very well known in Muncie. I think he was a lawyer, I don't remember. So uh, so I had a different experience, you know, with this. Now I think I don't think this, there is anything like that. As a matter of fact, we joined together and we had a research project funded with the biology department on bioethical issues and all kind of, you know, things uh, this group did. So now going back, what was your next that question? I. Oh, I was just curious about, um, I suppose, your sense of what Amir Shabazz felt that the university faculty, university educated Muslim members of the community were influential in um, uh, create, making Muncie more responsive and more accepting of Islam. Did you, did, you, did you have the same sense that he did? Well, I'm sure the, uh, I, I, I was not there really at that time. I was actually, the period you're talking about, I was not very well. I had a lot of health issues, heart and all kinds. So I, I had slowed down quite a bit. 
uh, well, in general, I'm sh I am sure uh, we have contributed a lot to the local community in the sense that they have come to know us, they have, they have come to know the religion through our interaction, you know. So in that way, and they have, I remember when I first came, I went to Mansi, they, they would say, well, there must be something uh, in your religion or your culture. Your children are so obedient, so, you know, when, because they just came, they were, you know, they, and we cannot do that to our children, you know. So there was, we, 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 you know, they would always think very positively about Islam, about Muslims. That was the impression uh, I had uh, from the, those times. But unfortunately, possibly it's not like that anymore. But it was a different, uh, you know, environment and different uh, impression I had at that time. I never felt uh, anything, you know, I never even thought of myself as Muslim or Hindu because I was, I mean, I was welcome like anything. As I said, I came to Mansi when my house had no electricity, no nothing. And these guys, you know, uh, he just came to my house. He brought some electric cord and, you know, attached it to something. I don't remember even what he did. And then brought some water hose. And so I'm sure he didn't think that, well, he's a Muslim, so I shouldn't be doing this. No, I mean, we were very, we were accepted like anyone else. That's why I didn't feel. Did your parents ever come and visit you once you moved to Muncie? My parents, no, they never came. They never visited any of their kids uh, overseas. Did you visit them? Yes, quite often. And um, did you have other family in what is now Bangladesh that you would visit? Just my sister. I, she just lost her husband last year, so uh, he was my classmate. He, he was a doctor, and uh, he, he wants to see me, and we are very close. He was just immediate younger sister, so and say, they said that she looks like me, so we have a little <laughs> stronger ties. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your career in statistics? Okay, then. Uh, if you have the patience, I will <laughs> tell you. It's a long story from where I started. Well, uh, I was not really very, I was a good student, but I was not a serious student. I, I would do a lot of partying and I used to play cards. And that is an addiction when you play cards. I used to play a lot of cards and uh, I was actually champion of bridge in my university, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so I was, uh, and uh, so I, edu uh, you know, studying, et cetera, was not the, was not foremost in my mind. Uh, but anyway, I went into statistics. Many people thought statistics was new at that time. People didn't even hear what statistics is. So, uh, if I said that I'm, I'm studying statistics, they thought I'm studying statics. In mathematics, there was static and dynamics. So, and I did not even know what I will do with statistics. Anyway, I finished my education, then I was working, and I remember the day I finished my master's, I gave all my expensive books, they were all British books, I gave it to another student. Because I said, I'm, I'm never going to touch book again. I'm so tired about reading and studying. But I had something else in my fate. When I got that call from Dr. McKinney, who is still alive, who is still in Muncie. And uh, there must have been some reason that uh, not knowing me, he called me and I didn't expect anything. I have really enjoyed my career in Muncie. When I went there, I am a person, I, if I live somewhere, that's my place. I didn't care whether the students were Christians, Muslims, Hindus, male, female, white, black, brown, doesn't matter. They are my, like my own children. I used to tell them that when I came in, the, in my 
older days, you know, I used to tell that when I came here, you kids were like my brother's sisters. Then you became like my daughters and sons. And now you're like grandchildren, <laughs> you know, so I have kind of transitioned. Uh, I worked like anything, you know, I would go early in the morning, I'll be home uh, sometimes at midnight. I was hired to teach statistics, but for what I did not know. When I went there, I found that the department wanted to develop a, an actuarial science program. So they wanted somebody to teach statistics, and that's, that just kind of turned me off. I said, no, I don't, I'm not an actuary. I can teach possibly some courses. Of course, I'll teach statistics, probability, etc. but that's not my field. So if I'm going to be here, I need to be, to have a program. So I talked to people and they, uh, Dr. Elizabeth would know how hard it is to develop a new program. I, it goes, starts from department and goes all the way to the university through different processes. And I did not know, I was not aware of all this, I was very new here. But I wanted to develop the program. Uh, there were some oppositions, quite strong opposition. And there were some who were very sympathetic, uh, especially those who came from the East Coast. Uh, they were very sympathetic. So you were, you were saying that you um, developed this program and there was some, some opposition, but not a lot. Could you um, explain a little bit more about a few of the highlights, uh, maybe your proudest moments uh, being the founder of that program? Okay, I will just add to that also that uh, I had also developed an undergraduate program in statistics, but uh, later it was uh, uh, converted into an applied math program. Uh, my proudest moments are when I see almost each and every student who had this program are very, very well placed in their careers without a single exception. This is one of my greatest satisfactions and they remember me. They are always in touch with me. Uh, I had, we, I didn't develop a PhD program because the state would not allow in those days because Purdue had a very big program and they would not allow another university to develop a statistics program and we could not have done it because for that we would need a lot of faculty. So I emphasized on a graduate program, where a kind of a two-track graduate program. One would be where the student would immediately join the workforce. Another would be where the student want to go for PhD. So we have, I had a lot of students who completed their PhDs and now working in different universities in this country. And uh, the proudest moment of my life. Well, I had a student who went to Harvard from here to Brown, but my proudest is about one student who hardly could speak any English. She, he had been writing from me from Korea. He heard about me that I I am kind of an exception. I do a lot of things others wouldn't do. So he had been writing to me for a long time and He's, he said, I can, if I will never pass English because I don't know English. So I somehow or other, because of his persuasion, I convinced my department, I convinced the dean that if I bring him, I will make sure that he would be a good finished product. Don't worry. So I brought him. He couldn't. Hardly one or two in the class, if I ask him a question, either he would nod his head or no, like that. Very few words he knew. I put him in English for a year or a year and a half, I don't remember now. Then uh, he, he not only spoke English, he spoke very good English. Now he speaks American English, you know, <laughs> because he learned almost fresh from the start. and. Uh, uh, to make, cut it short, he did his master's, then he did his PhD, 
and now he's a he's an assistant professor in Arkansas. He's trying to move to Texas. So that is possibly one signal, but there are many like that, many examples like that I can, you know, quote. In 2002, you were named Sagamore of the Wabash. Could you tell me a little bit more about how that happened and your response to that? Well, my, this is uh, something I did not even know much about. I didn't even expect, but one of the members of our Ball State University uh, trustee, one of the members of the trustee, uh, nominated me because my VTAP was accessible to them. They knew what I was doing in campus and not. So I was nominated. Of course, I got the, a copy of the letter that was sent. And I will not say he or she, I want to make it kind of, uh, the person would not want me possibly to name. Uh, so uh, I was nominated and I didn't give a second thought. I would, I never thought it will happen or anything. I've, and then, uh, of course, I was nominated for uh, contribution, my exceptional contribution to Ball State, to the higher education in Indiana and to statistics profession in general. This was the reasons. And then my wife got a call uh, from the governor's office that keep it secret. And uh, so I did not know. I had a visitor who was visiting me, uh, a professor. I was with him in my office. And the department, without letting me know, had arranged all kind of cake and everything by then, because my wife had to call the department. And uh, so uh, uh, the president was not there at that time. Uh, the uh, provost, Bet uh, his name is Beverly Pitts. She was present, so she, she came, but they were all hiding somewhere. I don't know. Then I was brought to that, to the secretary came and said, Dr. Ali, you have to go to the right. I said, why? He said, now please come. Uh, you know, someone wants to meet. And then I found all the people assembled there. And uh, so that's a great honor. I checked a little bit. Uh, I have not seen any other Muslim or even uh, foreign names before me. Of course, I read it, uh, the history, it says the uh, governors keep the secret, you know, so I don't know, but uh, I uh, know now, uh, recently there was an Indian girl, a lady, she was uh, awarded and she's now the head of uh, this uh, Medicare, Medicaid, all this, you know, in, uh, so, so it was something that uh, being not a Hoosier, one of uh, my colleagues in physics department said, Mir, you, for all purposes, you are a Hoosier. You have lived here long enough. You have worked long here. And uh, my dedication was to the state, to the country, where, who, which I called my country. Now I have lived here 50 years, more than half of my life. So this is what I know, and I think people realize my sincerity. And I still stand for, you know, the right thing. I don't, whoever, uh, uh, they know, I, many people would expect not all these things. I can show you some of the things that I have written to the president, all these, some angry letters I wrote. I was never shy, uh, but they also understood my sincerity that I was, even in the department, they knew that I'm not a destructive person. I was always constructive, but I will never, you know, hold my tongue. I will speak my mind. I will, if I say something is wrong, I would tell openly that this is not right. But that doesn't mean that I would not join them in the, you know, development of the department. Uh, so I still care about everything and I'm so, uh, proud that the state where I spent all my life in USA uh, recognized me. 
And still, I mean, especially it is so, uh, you know, important to me because it was just immediately after the 9-11, just a few months after that. It was unthinkable for a Muslim, these climate was such. So it, I feel it's possibly one of the greatest honors I have in my life. Speaking of 9-11, do you remember any um, challenges that the, that the community in Muncie faced or you yourself faced? Well, any time something like that happens, uh, first of all, I did not even know in the beginning when it happened, we did not know. I was coming to the, I was driving to the department. My daughter called me and said, Dad, did you watch TV? I said, no, what is happening? He said, there is a big accident in uh, New York. Some plane hit the World Trade Center. So I went to the department. I went on the fourth floor and there was a big crowd in front of a classroom which had a TV. And I went there and I, I watched the second tower going down, but we did not know at the time what was happening. Of course, we later found out. As a matter of fact, my wife's nephew was in that ward center because his office was there. And uh, I'm told he went out for coffee or something when it happened. So there are many stories like that, you know, where things just happen. Now, reactions, when this kind of things happen, of course, people get emotional, people get excited, uh, judgmental, all kinds. Uh, I realized that it would be possibly difficult to go to mosque because the sentiment is so high, you know, about, you know. But it is really very important for people to know that all these church people, they came to the mosque and said, you go and pray, we'll be protecting you, we'll watch, no harm comes to you. That, that was the great lesson that I learned. That even in this kind of climate, there is always something good. You know, there are pe good people in this world who, you know, uh, care for, you know, goodness and everything. So, uh, yes, th those things, you know, I mean, these are the things which really made me think sometimes uh, what, I, what is going to happen to me as a Muslim, you know. But I never thought of these things before. And I viewed still these things. You know, if, uh, if you ask me this question, uh, it may not be proper to answer, tell, but let me just tell my heart. Whatever we are seeing in this, what is happening, these Muslims are doing, this is not the Islam I knew, I grew up with. I never heard about all these things. I never knew this, and I am so sorry this is happening. These people are doing this for the sake of religion. These are, to me, these are all political things. And they are hurting people like us, the real Muslims they are hurting. And I am so sorry this is also happening here because of ignorance. I have heard very well-known priests and, you know, what do you call them, the, you know, who, like Billy Graham's son, telling that this is an evil religion. I don't think he has ever read the Quran. I can challenge. He has not read. It's all hearsay. They get, go to, you know, get popular support. This is, these are the things what hurt me. I have, they talk about so many things like they will go heaven and do, there is nowhere. You, you know, there is Google, you can go and charge, uh, search and see if Quran says that, yes, if they do this, they will, you know, make it to heaven and this, there is nowhere. There is no verse saying this. So uh, many things are coming from ignorance, for political reason, uh, for, from unscrupulous politicians, religious people, ordinary people. And when I think we all know that if a lie is told hundred times, then that lie becomes a truth. And that's what is happening, unfortunately. And, uh, but I, I stay above all these things. I don't, 
I, I'm not really concerned about that. I think there are good people in this country, lot of good people. I do not know uh, today, yesterday, what happened in Carmel. Are you familiar with that? We had a mosque to be mm -hmm. built mm -hmm. and it was approved. Mm -hmm. There were hundreds. My wife also went. I cannot go there for such a long time. So there are always people who would be, you know, there are always two sides, but I think there are people who understand. And uh, so I, I do not worry about my future, or, but I get a little bit emotional because uh, now the card that I never want to play, like the religious card, you know, it is coming into picture because of what is happening in the last two years. So, in addition to 9-11, I want to talk a little bit about um, other international events that may have influenced you, yourself or your family or the Muslim community here in, um, or in Muncie. Um, to what extent did things like the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003 or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or more recently the Syrian civil war um, did these events have any impact that you recognized in the community? Uh, not really. I, I think uh, for some of them, I, I never, uh, I'm never political and I never like to go for these things. So I never went to any of this, you know. Uh, but I think my personal, you know, uh, judgment is it was not right as most Americans feel now to go to Iraq. I think war, if we learn, try to learn from history, war never solved any problem. You go back in time, it never, you know, solved problems and uh, it created more problems for us now. So, uh, yes, the reaction uh, was, uh, at that time I did not know all the facts. So it was like, uh, you know, uh, one Muslim country taking land from another, uh, Iraq taking land from Kuwait and things like that. That's what created that problem. And then uh, later, uh, Iraq, I think, uh, was also for this nuclear thing or something like that. And they found nuclear, you know, all kinds of, but they ultimately found that there was nothing. So that's politics and uh, all I know is I have to live with those things, but I never wanted any war, whether it is between Palestinians and, uh, and Israelis or uh, this, what is happening in uh, Syria. Uh, this is so complicated. This is so complicated, you know, uh, there are a lot of powers involved there. And uh, yesterday, also I saw, you know, again, Soviet, I mean, Russia went and, you know, they bombed, is that something like that? And then, or, or might be they, with their support, uh, uh, Syrian government, you know, they bombed. And so ultimately, who are the victims? We don't see them. We don't see the victims. We, and, and uh, th this is, uh, war doesn't produce any positive result in my mind, in my judgment. And I think uh, I really like the young generations. In every generation, it's the young people who really bring the changes, not the old people. Their minds are fixed. You know, I remember those, you were not born even then, you know, with the flowers and all these things on the, you know, uh, cars, they would paint all the flowers and this and that of the 60s. They would fight against Vietnam War and all this. But they were right. They brought a lot of changes and we didn't even like their look at that time. So uh, now we have a generation, you can see what happens after uh, this school shooting. Now it's a big thing. And one thing if I, if I may add, when this shooting took place, you nobody said, Parkland? Parkland. 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 Yeah. One week ago, nobody said that it was Christians who did this. 
But if it would have been a one Muslim, then it would have been a Muslim thing. So this is labeling, and unfortunately, we, this is the time, and we have to live through that. I, I'm not a politician, I don't do politics, I, but uh, these are facts. These are facts, how we label things, how we, you know, advertise things. Do you think it's difficult for the Muslim community in the United States to, um, to equally uh, share a collective grief when some people are, uh, when a lot of Muslims are looked, up, looked, looked at uh, as potential suspects or uh, looked at suspiciously by the media or by other people? I think th this is, again, these are questions. Uh, not all Americans feel that way. There will be always some would feel. Uh, yes, I mean, realistically for some Muslims also it would be difficult. Of course, uh, uh, many may feel that well, I'm going to share this grief just to show, you know, but it could be genuine. So it, it is a difficult issue. I really cannot tell, uh, you know, how that is perceived. Uh, but uh, I think the people who count in my judgment, uh, they would understand, you know, uh, the sincerity of the people who are grieving. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, and especially I would like to add, people here are all, Muslims here are all educated. You, you don't have one, like, uh, third grader here, you know, who came after, third. they're all highly educated. And they understand, and their attitude is different. Maybe some, some may be a little bit more conservative than others, but uh, if they see a, something sad happening to somebody within their community or outside, they would feel, they would grieve the same way. I, I, I would not doubt at all about that. Um, you're, you seem to have had a very um, wide-ranging life, um, a lot of um, wonderful experiences. Can you trace your view of life back to any one person in your in, growing up, uh, maybe a parent or um, a mentor? Uh, well, of course, my parents, but if I leave them alone, <laughs> it's my older brother, my or elder brother. Uh, I always look up to him. Uh, that's how I'm in statistics. Uh, he had a lot of contribution to my coming here, to Canada and here. Uh, he had provided a lot of emotional support and everything. Uh, so he, he and we were, we became very good friends. He was seven years older than me. and. Uh, uh, he would not admit I talked to him when we were older, you know, he would even slap me if I could, couldn't do a, an uh, addition right or something like that. He was very strict like my mother. He was a very good student, and uh, so, but he was very loving. He would take care of the whole family. He would, you know, when my father was old, he would even, you know, support, uh, you know. So he was, he is something, he passed away and, uh, when I, I was, I retired, he was sick, very sick, and there was a conference. He came, he, and, uh, he, he was really sick, but he still came. He gave a talk, and I cannot believe that he would come in that condition, you know, with his health. He said uh, that the last thing not to come, you know. So he was, uh, uh, you know, I admired him as a statistician. He was the... He was from the first batch of statistics from Dhaka University. Uh, he's one person I would really look up to. Other than my parents, they, we, I always look up to them. They were both unique parents. And I think I would not say that because to every kid, parents are unique. They have a lot of contributions. What are your hopes for the future? For? For yourself in the future or your family or? The world? Well, I live in the present. I still try to publish. I publish. Uh, I do things. I uh, 
in touch with my students and pitch with other researchers. I don't really, I, I, my life is like this. I live for a day. I, I, some people would tell me, you don't have a single wrinkle. How come you are in your 80s? I said, there is a reason. Because when I go to bed at night, just practice this. When I go to bed, I, think, I try to think of one good thing, small or big, doesn't matter what I did. And if I find that I have even given a good advice to someone, then I sleep like a baby. And if I find that I couldn't do anything to any, that really makes me upset. So uh, that's my life. I, I try to help people and uh, I always try to see goodness in people doesn't matter what their background, what their, you know, religion. Uh, and I, I think, you see, I have also a responsibility as a Muslim to the rest of the community. As I do not, I cannot expect everything from them. I have also some res responsibility. I have weaknesses. I come with a lot of fixed ideas myself. So I cannot, you know, put everything that goes wrong with me on others. I should learn how to take the blame myself or share. So life is like that. There is always differences. And I tell as a statistician, God was the greatest statistician because he believed in differences in, you know, all this what we measure by standard deviation. If everything was identical, there would be a, this would be some boring place to live. So uh, it is, uh, we, we have to live with this, you know, in the future. I, I only feel, if you ask, if you meant that, how I feel in terms of people, children, everything, it is all, I do not know about this culture, but when we were growing in my culture, my father would always say, oh, we were so good, so this, you people are turning like that. And I possibly repeated that same thing to my children. You will do the same thing to your children. So uh, I think everything brings in something good, something bad, but we have to watch. And I always, uh, I am a very, uh, uh, optimistic person. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of good things that will be coming in the future, but with all this progress in technology, life would be also very difficult. I know when I was teaching, I always like to learn things, so I've been uh, still very good with computers, this and that, and you know, picture loading, picture this, that. I, I always, even if it's from a kid, I would learn. But some of my colleagues who are older, they say it's time to retire because now we have to report the grades online and things like that. So, uh, you know, it, things are changing so fast now. Uh, I, I do not know how it would be. I still worry uh, sometimes uh, about that. But I think people would live in a better world. There would be a lot of better people. You have to think like that. You cannot think otherwise. As one final question, um, I want to give you a few moments to reflect on it before you answer. Um, what is one event or story from your life that captures what it means to you to be a Muslim in America? Okay. So before I answer, Muslim American or American Muslim, can I answer first a question how it feels to be an, a Bangladeshi American or American first and then go there? Sure. Okay. My answer to your First question as such, uh, it's very easy to answer, but uh, I'll just contribute a little bit. I go first. When I first came to this country, 
to USA. I never heard this before. They would all, all ask me after they talk to me and, you know, I'm a professor here, I would not, they would not know anything beyond that. They would end with, aren't you so glad you are in America? And I would say, oh yes. But I did not know what he or she had in the mind. I thought he was a well-wisher, you know. So I heard this repeatedly, year after year after year after year. When one person told me, asked me the same question, but he added a little bit more to it, then all it, it all made sense to me, what they were really talking about. He said, aren't you happy that you are here, your people, they are dying, they are begging, they are sleeping on the street. So now I figured out what they really meant. So it is their ignorance. They associated their experience with my experience. And what happened was, if you go in the early history of European migration, these are the people who had no education, who were poor, who had, you know, who were perse religiously persecuted. These are the people who came. So most of the time you will see that my mother was, you know, a maid in the hotel and now I am running for president. You know, that's the story of the European but the Indian subcontinent, the people coming from our side, our story is different. Now you have found the story. My father was a lawyer. There are four PhDs, all PhDs. How many American families are there even, even in this country? I'm not boasting. I'm not being immodest. They could not believe this. They thought I come from there where my father was begging or something. They had no idea. So when they found out, then I told that, yes, my brother is this man. They asked more questions. Then he said, then why are you here? It's a good question. I have no answer. But that's what ignorance is. They're related with their forefathers. And uh, people that you see, the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, they all come from the top echelon of the society. They are here for their personal reasons. Maybe making life a little better, not really whole better. Maybe the freedom they have here. You understand? There are other reasons, but not the reasons they think about. So, as, a, as an American Muslim, I think the same example would apply. If those who know me as a Muslim, those Americans who know me as a Muslim, who have visited my home, who have... I have most of my friends are Americans. I have very few friends because there, are not a big, there is not a big family, a you know, group of Muslims uh, in Muncie. So all my friends, very best friends are Americans still. And when we talk, we don't even think for a moment we are Christian, Christian or Muslim. I, work with a lot of Christian uh, uh, colleagues, you know. So uh, this is coming to my mind, especially during the last two years, when Islam has made the evil religion. The, but uh, this is very sad. Uh, of course, I am now, this has made me become more aware of my religion. And I only hope that people don't do that. This would only divide people. This would only create more problems. I think we should understand that people are people. Good people are good people. If you have bad people, if you have a shooter, you have a shooter in all religions. It doesn't, you know, it is not the monopoly of one religion. Uh, but we have to be very careful what we say what we do, these are very important in these days, and especially in these days of communications. Uh, uh, when I first came to Canada, I, if I write a letter, it took three weeks to go, three weeks to come back. So uh, to get a, 
I'm eager to hear from my wife, but it would be six weeks before I could hear. Now, with all this cell phone and a telephone call from Canada to my country, you know, would be about $100 in those days currency. They, you call, book a trunk call, it will come after three, four hours. So that would be possibly like three, four thousand dollars today's currency. So we couldn't call as a student, you know, we'll just write letters and now it is so quick. Everything is, you know, everything is flushed, you know, you do something here all over the world. As a matter of fact, when I travel home, I see a lot of things that I don't see here because those are not shown here. So this is, you go to Europe, you see something else on TV, you know. So these are all, now it is very difficult. We live in a, you know, they don't even want to believe the print media. I mean, even if it is true, you know it is true, but it's hard to. So we live in a very difficult, and I'm not going, uh, uh, you know, as a Muslim, I would live the same way as I li lived before, as I lived here, and I will not change my attitude. People are people, there are good people, there are not so good people, but we have to live with them. And so are we. We are good, some of us are not so good. We have to live uh, with each other. And important thing is, this is my home. I have no home now other than this home. This is the home I know. These are the people, I, when I look at you, I don't look at you any differently than if I look at my own son. I don't see any difference. Actually, I mean, I'm colorblind. I, I don't see, uh, I don't remember. Uh, and uh, so the, I hope people can learn through us. And if you say what contribution, I think Mansi has been blessed to have this different religious groups there, not only Muslims, but even Hindus, you know, that must have made a positive impact on, on the, on the group community there. I think we have, uh, those of us who live there, we have leave, left a good legacy there, not a bad one. Not too many people can speak anything bad about the community. And we were very, very, uh, uh, you know, interested in developing the community, the people, we live there as if this is our home. And this was, this was my home. I lived here for 50, almost 50 years. And my loyalty is to America. That's, that's my country. That's my children's country, my grandchildren's country. And uh, of course, I was born there. I will always have a lot of sweet memories of my countries. I will miss the people. That's part of my life also. So that's the story. I, I don't know where, what is there in future. I, I only hope that I can die uh, with the feeling that there is no hatred in this world like this that we see today. It is really very, very painful. Well, thank you, Dr. Ali. On behalf of the Virginia B. Ball Center Seminar, Muslims and Muncie, I want to thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you very much, Ben. This was my privilege, and uh, thank you again.